Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us here today at the Sunshine Cathedral via the website. And we want to welcome you to our worship services whenever you're in the Fort Lauderdale area. If you are in the area, we invite you to worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 1030 a.m. We're located at 1480 Southwest 9th Avenue. And for those who watch us weekly on the internet, we invite you to check our website often for other listings and programming that we might have that may be of interest to you. And for now, I invite you to come in and worship with us here at the Sunshine Cathedral. Well, we have a share in the chair again. Uh, we'll be doing that through Advent. We're, we'll be talking with people uh, at this part of the service about the theme of the day. And uh, those things are given to us here in Advent. The first Sunday is Hope Sunday and then peace and then joy and then love. And so to talk about hope today uh, is our executive minister, Reverend Dr. Uh, what's your name? Robert Griffin. <laughs> I kept wanting to call him Mrs. Claus for some reason. <laughs> Gary Lane asked earlier if we had to rent those costumes. I said, no, they're ours. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, um, so hope. Hope is what uh, Robert's going to tell us about. So I have just a few questions for you. Um, because the truth is, you're probably the most optimistic person uh, I've ever met. Um, we met in 1996 in theology school. And uh, yeah, way back when we were, we were young and thin and pretty and now we're well educated. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, we, we met way back when. And just even then, I mean, just uh, you were not only kind and, and, and curious, but just extremely optimistic. And then throughout our lives together and throughout our ministries together, um, when my hope is waning, I often draw from yours. You, you, you're inspiring with how not only you emanate hope and you, and you inspire others to, uh, to find and embrace their hope. How do you do it? I mean, I, you know, I've known you since 1996. Where does this hope come from? How is it that you always have enough to see you through and even some to share with others? I asked for the questions in advance. Well, that's the first one. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think when I hear that question, the thing that comes to my mind is actually something that my mother taught me as a kid growing up, and that was always to be hopeful. Uh, for those who don't know, I may have said this often, you may have not heard me say it before, but I'm actually the last of 14 siblings uh, in my family. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, that, that brought within itself a certain amount of hope within the family. Uh, <laughs> uh, but also, you know, I, I was born and raised at the end of a dirt row in a four-room house with a tin roof. Uh, I know all about our houses and going to the well to get water. So don't let all this fool you. Just say But she always said to me about being hopeful. Whatever situation you find yourself in, baby, uh, just remember that someone who is always worse off than you. So be very thankful for what you have and be very grateful for what you have and always be hopeful that those who are less fortunate than you are, that you, and she always kind of threw back to me, that you can do something to help someone else along the way. So even as a young kid, that, 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 that thing about hope really came from my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that she was very hopeful, she was very forward looking and to, you know, to raise me as the baby of 14 kids, she was very hopeful that I didn't stray. Yeah. No, and her kids all turned out pretty great. Well. Um, you the best, certainly. Um, but the, um, you talked about the other night, and Reverend Ann had a, a film, The, the uh, Last Men Standing, about uh, people who had become HIV positive in the 80s, and they're still here. Uh, some of them not doing as well, uh, but they're still around. And, um, and you told your story at the end of that uh, about uh, being diagnosed in the 86 and still being here. How much did hope play in your survival? I mean, because I remember when I met you, there were still monotherapies and they weren't very promising. And, and uh, so you were, you were having to live basically on hope before there were even good medicines yet. So how did, how did hope uh, contribute to your healthy living all these years? Um, 
finding hope in the midst of a kind of a war zone with HIV and AIDS is very different because you didn't know what was going to happen from the next day to the, you know, from, from day to day uh, in those early days. I tested positive in 86. I was on active duty in the military, and that within itself was a whole different scenario altogether. But to be hopeful in that situation when, you know, friends literally were dying day and night, you woke up the next morning, you didn't know who was going to be there, who wasn't going to be there. So it really was just a time that you, we found ways to go within and find hope just to go from day to day because you just didn't know what was going to happen. A lot of things was uncertain back that day. And so, again, going back to my mother, drawing strength on that hope that she instilled in me, just hope for the best mm -hmm. and keep moving forward and don't let the present situation define who you are because you have to keep going forward. Uh, you know, and at that time, I also shared that same night. You know, I was a group of 42 individuals uh, that started out together uh, in our own cohort, and I'm the last one alive from those 42 at that time. So, and, and to think of that group and to think of being the last one, and not that they didn't have hope, but it was different to say, now I have to deal with uh, survivor's guilt and look at hope from a very different perspective. Well, that, that, that brings me to the last question. Um, you know, hope is, you know, hope is great, when it keeps you to the, you know, the, the, the next medical breakthrough or it, it, it keeps you going until you find uh, that great partner or that great career opportunity or, or you're finally able to let go of something that's very, very painful. What about people that they hoped as much as, as you hoped? They, uh, their hope was profound and it didn't seem to have pay, off, pay off the same dividends. It, it didn't lead to maybe uh, a miracle. I, those 41 people uh, probably at some point had a great hope. and. Uh, so what can you say about the importance of hope even when it doesn't grant the wish, even when it doesn't make the miracle happen? How is it not wasted? How is it still important to have hope even when the outcome isn't what you had wished for? I think that part of hope for me has been to realize that at this point, I carry the hope of those who are no longer with me. And mm -hmm. that part of hope is still a part of who I am today because even in the midst of things going wrong, there's still hope. You gotta have hope that it's gonna get better, that the situation is not gonna be the end result of where you are now. And to realize that there's hope beyond those who have gone on before you and that you draw strength from their, from their inspiration because they didn't make it, but yet you're still hopeful for the situation you find yourself in and that it will be hope for those who are gonna come behind you. Well, those are some pretty profound words uh, on the power of hope. What a great way to kick off Advent and the new Christian year. Would you please thank Dr. Griffin for sharing his words of hope. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark. Jesus declared, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows. In these human words, God's voice is heard. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? Let us dwell together in peace, and let us not be instruments of our own or others' oppression. And now, may God's word be spoken. May only God's word be heard. Amen. Amen. Well, Jesus saying, no one knows the day or the hour. The chapter 13 in Mark's gospel uh, has a lot in it. And uh, it begins with people telling Jesus, you know, we look at, these, look at this temple, look at these stones, look at these pillars, look at, look at how magnificent this is. And Jesus says, well, yeah, but it won't be here forever. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to fall. <laughs> it's going to fall down. And, uh, and then from those smoldering ashes, something else will come. Something else will, will break through. But no one knows. <laughs> all of these things will happen. All of this turmoil, all of this distress, all of this chaos. And, and no one knows when that's going to happen. But that won't be the end of the story. So that's, that's what's happening. It's actually written after those things had, had occurred. Mark's gospel is written in the year 70 the year the temple was destroyed. And so Mark is sort of reading back, is, is, is saying that uh, b by putting it in Jesus' mouth is giving his community coping skills for how do we get through this turmoil? How do we get through the ruins? How do we get through the world as we have known it has ended? And how can we renew our hope and start building another day? 
And he says, that's, that's possible. That is possible. But no one knows when or how that's going to happen. It reminds me, this no one knows. <laughs> we, we've got to have hope for the future, but we can't predict what it's going to look like or when it's going to show up. It reminds me of a great old hymn of the faith. We all grew up singing it. When I was just a little girl, I ask my mother, what will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? Here's what she said to me. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. I see we all attended the same church. <laughs> Pastored by Doris Day. No one really knows what the future holds. Trends can show us what is likely to happen. And we've all made some lucky guesses now and then. But mostly, the future is always unfolding and is not predetermined. Jesus says in today's gospel that situations change. What seemed permanent can pass away. But he also says that his words will last. His words of hope. Words of hope tend to linger, or at least the hope itself tends to linger. Maybe that's why, as the song we heard earlier, maybe that's why the Apostle Paul said, there are three things that do last. Faith, hope, and love. And so Jesus says, yes, situations change. Yes, things you thought you could count on may change. Even things that you revered may come crashing down, but there is still hope. My words will remain. The gospel, the good news, is a message of hope, and the power of that hope remains. Advent, this is the first Sunday of Advent. Advent begins the Christian year. Happy New Year, everyone. This begins the Christian year. And the first Sunday of Advent which is the first season of the Christian year, focuses on hope. Advent is a time for waiting. And while you're waiting, you're sustained by hope. Now, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for all kinds of things, but Advent specifically is about waiting for something good that's on its way. Waiting for Christmas, certainly. The holiday, the celebration, the parties, the, the services, the... Uh, uh, the, the vigils, the rituals, the gift giving, the dinners. We're, we're waiting for Christmas. And some see Advent as a time of waiting for the return of Jesus. I don't fall into that camp because Jesus has never been absent in my life. So I'm not waiting for him to come back because I've not ever known a day without him. And so maybe that's because I was raised in the Bible Belt, where that's just part of the culture. Maybe it's because I was raised in a church-going family. Uh, maybe it's because uh, I was um, raised in church, or, 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 or I don't know. But somehow Jesus has always been part of my imagination, has always been part of my thinking, has always been part of my life. And so there is no absent Jesus to come back, which is why I believe the scriptures tell us that Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always. So how does one who never left come back? So I'm not waiting for a return because I've not ever been without him. Jesus is with us in our stories and in our rituals and in our imaginations. We give body to his memory as the church, the body of Christ. And the light that people saw in Jesus is also in us. He said in the Sermon on the Mount, you are the light of the world. So for Christians, Christ is always present. So I'm not waiting for Jesus. I'm waiting for Christianity to re-embrace Jesus. Now I'm not talking about bumper stickers. That's cheap and easy. I'm not talking about billboards. They're usually very wrong. I'm not talking about people who have different vocabularies and different symbols for their faith experience. I'm not talking about judging and condemning people who worship differently. I'm not talking about making Jesus into a club to beat people up with. 
I am not talking about making Jesus into an idol, something to be venerated and, and adored, not making him into a golden calf. We've done that well enough, so we don't need to improve on that. No, I'm waiting for Christians en masse to re-embrace Jesus' values, not certain prejudices, but his values of compassion, his desire for justice, his desire for all people to be fed, his desire for all who are ill to be healed, his desire for all who are lonely to be loved, his desire for all who are afraid to be encouraged, his desire for all who hurt to be comforted. A religion about Jesus doesn't honor Jesus. Where he is the guest of honor, where he is the grand marshal of the big parade, where he gets to wear the big hat and sit in the big chair, that hasn't really done much for us. 2,000 years of that, and there is still greed and selfishness and war and bigotry. Maybe that wasn't the symbol we should have stuck with. A religion about Jesus doesn't honor Jesus. Rather, it tends to distort his powerful message. No, we don't need a religion about Jesus. We need the religion of Jesus. And the religion of Jesus is a living and world-engaging spirituality that works and waits for the kingdom of God to be made manifest. That's what we so desperately need. When the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news he proclaimed about God's kingdom, where the first are last and the last are first, where the so-called least of these are remembered and blessed, where hunger is not acceptable, where untreated illness is unthinkable, where refugees are seen as God's children in need of welcome and concern. When that gospel is remembered and reclaimed and put into action, then the Christ nature will have returned and will dwell among us and within us. And for that, I am waiting. But waiting can be exhausting. Waiting takes a lot of patience. Waiting takes a lot of energy. And I admit to getting tired. Thank God I have a partner in ministry and a partner in life, a husband who has the gift of optimism. Because when I am exhausted, he can help pick me up. That's why we're all here, so we can help pick each other up. Because it is tiring. And I'll confess to being tired. I'm tired of discrimination being uplifted as a virtue. I'm tired of hatred being presented as if it were love. I'm tired of people being beat up and told that that's the gospel. What that is is a lie. I'm tired of refugees fleeing war and famine only to be rejected when they arrive at new shores. I'm tired of needing to remind people that women are in charge of women's bodies. I'm tired of needing to make the case that love is love is love. I'm tired of having to remind people, you tell me what your gender is. I don't get to tell you what your gender is. I'm tired of the poor and the sick and the elderly being abandoned and it being called reform. And I'm damned angry when these atrocities are committed in the name of Jesus. Do it in the name of politics. Do it in the name of power. Do it in the name of privilege. Do it in the name of, eco of economics. Do it in the name of what you think is common sense, but don't you dare do it in the name of Jesus, who touched the untouchables and sat with people that, he, that society said he should never sit with, who loved the unlovable, who confronted people who were demon-possessed, filled with angst and anger and rage and self-loathing and mental illness, and he confronted their issues and loved them into wholeness. No, do not reject. Do not kick out into the street. Do not say you're on your own and say, that's because I'm a person of faith. You may think it's the right thing, but it's not the Jesus thing. Let's be clear. And so, I'm not waiting for Jesus to start getting his mail here on planet Earth. I'm waiting for those who claim to be his church to care about all the children of God. Theologian G.K. Chesterton 
once remarked, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. The Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. It's so much easier to sing, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, it's easy to sing songs. It's easy to create rituals. It's easy to have pageantry. It's easy to adore Jesus and make him the symbol of the party and the leader of the parade. That is much easier than fighting for the dignity of senior citizens. It is much easier to venerate Jesus than to affirm the sacred value of LGBTQ people. It is easier to say words about Jesus than to work for peace. It is easier to claim to love Jesus than to demand that our national and global resources be used to stamp out hunger and disease. It's easy to love Jesus. It's harder to love ourselves and our neighbors, which is what Jesus asked us to do. And so we have settled for venerating a glorified Christ, rather than following a gritty, hardworking Jesus. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, you'll blow smoke up my skirt. <laughs> Jesus said, if you love me, you'll feed my sheep. If you love me, you'll feed my sheep. The world waits for us to follow Jesus' example of feeding and healing and welcoming those in need. But we dare not give up hope. No matter what happens under the cover of darkness in the halls of power, we dare not give up hope. Hope is what sustains us while we wait. Hope is how we handle an unknown future. Hope doesn't always grant our wishes, but it keeps us going in the difficult times. And sometimes, our wishes do finally come true. The prophet Habakkuk wrote, there is a vision. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. There is a vision. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will come. There is a vision of God's kingdom. There is a vision of equality. There is a vision of justice. There is a vision of peace. There is a, just, there is a vision of everyone having enough and sharing what they have and living in joy and peace and harmony. There is a vision. It hasn't come yet. We're not looking at it in the natural world yet, but the vision exists. Cling to it. Hope for it. Believe in it. Work for it. It will surely come. Religion may have fallen asleep at the switch. Democracy may have gotten a bit lazy. Injustice and tyranny may seem to get the upper hand now and then, but there is a vision of God's kingdom. And if it continues to tarry, we will nevertheless insist that it is on its way and we will do what we can to make room for it. We may not know how or when Christ's vision for God's kingdom will come to pass, but if we won't give up, we can know that something good is on the way. It may take work, it may take time, but there is good for us and we ought to have it. All shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We will be repaid for the years the locusts have eaten. A temporarily homeless, unwed mother can give birth in a stable and her family can become refugees in Egypt and her baby can still grow up to change lives for two millennia and counting. Don't give up. Don't give up the vision. Don't give up the hope that makes not giving up possible. Something good is on the way, somehow, someday. And so we wait with hope. And this is the good news. Amen.
Thank you for joining us today here at the Sunshine Cathedral. If you're ever in the Fort Lauderdale area, we invite you to stop by and worship with us on Sunday mornings at 9 and 10.30 a.m. If you'd like to make a donation to the Sunshine Cathedral, or if you'd like to find out other resources that the cathedral has to offer, please visit us at www.sunshinecathedral.org. Until the next time, we look forward to seeing you here at the Sunshine Cathedral.